Well, welcome. Hi, Marcy Brown. I am so, so, I feel so blessed to have this experience with you. I love you to pieces, to the moon and back. Um, we've known each other for 15 or 16 years, and uh, we've had a common um, work together. Uh, you've gone through a lot of my material, the drbeth.com uh, coaching process, and uh, are one of my certified coaches. And uh, we're just going to just play today. So tell us yeah. about you and how you got attracted to working in the Dr. Beth world. Oh, boy. So, yeah, it's been a, a long time, 15 plus years, and it's been a huge journey. Um, and I and I got connected when, with you when I was beginning my coaching career and um, I was in the middle of my psychology degree, wondering where I wanted to go in life. And it hasn't been a straight path by any means, but um, I think at the time, Maddie, my daughter was a toddler and you helped me through those phases. And she's now a teenager and um, 18 and you're helping me through all those phases. And I think that, um, you know, in my life um, through the finance career that I built and, and always wanting that um, coaching aspect, whether I was coaching a team um, in the finance career, or just coaching people, you and I have always stayed connected. And that's what I love because we're so aligned in our thinking and in our mission of, you know, helping people shine their light so the world can see. And it's not just a, it's not just a key phrase. It's not a t-shirt. <laughs> it's a no, daily, no. daily process, yes. hourly process. And you've given such great, I'm a practical girl. Um, I, I love money and logic and, you know, rational <laughs> and logistics, <laughs> literal, and, Yes, but you bring the fun and spontaneity as well as the tools to apply things. And that's what I love and cling on to. And so I want this opportunity to share some of that with the rest of the world in awesome. a way that they can hear it um, awesome. and pause, and rewind, playback. Wait, yes. this, what? these are so many gold what? nuggets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah. I think I think we are a fantastic balance. Um, you personally are like my ideal avatar of a rock star of a human being, a rock star of a mom. I know, and 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 I always tell parents um, that say they shake their head whenever I say that, and I say that even that you're humble. Not only are you a rock star, but you're a humble rock star. <laughs> and so how so so how to um, how to get that process in um in your in, in the balance between what i call the the super 7 year old and the puppy dog who is and the puppy dog 7 year old or 3 year old <laughs> I, I i think he is integrating his inner teen right now cuz just cuz i say so does not make it so um <laughs> but i have my other little one that's behind me just loving up on my back he's being a perfect <laughs> He's being a perfect super seven year old in this in this game. So, you know, one one of the things I thought that might be helpful would be to use some of the tools, use some of the language that I teach and then talk about how that language, because it's way uncommon, common sense. And a, and a lot of people that are that are the um super seven year olds extraordinaire they're like what is she talking about the inner three year old the inner seven year old the inner teen you know use use um more formal language <clears throat> but one of the reasons i i take what like i take what is um uncommon and i bring it back to us so i'm coming in a part of everybody's brain that you're going to be going, huh? What is she talking about? And I always invite people to, to, um, yeah, but me, um, you get bonus points. If you tell me, no, um, I, I love it when there's, when there's a way I'm playing with my dog while we're talking, keeping him. <laughs> <in the day. laughs> 
we if, as moms know that you have to multitask. You have to be exactly, able to keep everything in order. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And and so some of these concepts can make I call the super seven year old the logical, the rational, the next world leader adult, um, the uh, the brilliant, the super successful, usually highly professional. Sometimes some of my words, uh, you're used to just knocking it out of the park. Like you, you learn so quickly and you, everything makes sense until that moment when you have a toddler or until that moment and you have a teenager or until that moment and you go through a divorce or until that moment and you have an entire business you've built and you're like, I feel like the business owns me instead of me owning me owning the business. This is when you and I can step in for the, for the rest of the world, you know, running the marathon, uh, doing, doing the process, doing the do it goes and it goes and it goes. I, I had this one woman that I worked with and she managed over a thousand employees. Uh, she was so put together. Um, she, her, her house was just immaculate until the second child came along. And when the second child came along, she lost it. Everything and every tool and everything that she'd all, always said that would work stopped working. So those are the people that we're talking to. So if, if that resonates with you, that um, you know you're all that in a bag of chips, of course, you would never say that. Like Marcy, you have humility and uh, you don't even let yourself know that you're all that in a bag of chips. But there's some part of you way back in your mind that has a superiority complex. And there's another part of you that has an inferiority complex. And with these two aspects of ourselves, it's like part of me feels like, you know, I'm beyond this. And part of me feels like I should be further along than this. And part of me feels like I'm, I'm kind of better than other people. I've already mastered. I've evolved um, more than most. Yet there's something underneath that keeps coming in and tearing away that confidence and tearing away that brilliance and tearing away that beautiful shine. So what what are you hearing in what I'm saying, Marcy? True or yeah, false? So, so um, very true, first of all, like that resonates. And I love how you said, you know, this can apply to so many scenarios. Um, this can apply to me as a leader in my business as a manager, if you're working with a staff, if you're owning a business, any kind of relational <laughs> involvement. Exactly. It happens with your spouse. It happens with your kids. It happens with your friends, your family. There adult are adult so siblings, many, adult, adult siblings, exes. Yes, exes, all of that. And so what we're really talking about is that we're we have it together. We, we're, our lives are good. Yeah. We, looking, we looking good, looking good on the outside. We look good, But underneath we have this, these emotions that are brewing, mm -hmm. these feelings that don't go away, this gnawing, this maybe repetitive pattern, like, oh my gosh, I, I stopped, I left my job so I could open a business and here the same thing is happening. Now wherever you I go, have employees. There you are. Wherever same you go, relationships. You are. Wherever you go, <laughs> there you are. Here we go but again. Point, I'm, I'm pointing the finger at me saying, yes. oh crap, I might have to change. And that's where you come in yeah. and help here, us. Here we grow again is actually what I like to say. <laughs> Here we, gr here we grow again and, and how to take that, um, how to, how to take that, what feels like an epic fail and humiliating and vulnerable and I should know better, or I, you know, I'm a coach and I, I know better, or I'm a, um, I'm a doctor and I know better, or I'm a professional and, you know, what, whatever, whatever it may be, there's a should a big should monster that is coming to the party. And one of the things that I, everything I teach, everything I teach, um, I've gone through myself. 
it's all been a journey of evolving and awakening and um, learning how to feel my feelings without making myself bad and wrong and learning uh, and creating the 10 keys to compassion and meeting my inner family when I thought I was just going to talk to my little three-year-old. You know, everybody talks about the inner child. And I was talking to my little inner three-year-old and I said, hi, little B. And she said, fuck you. And I was like, oh my, oh my. <laughs> I'm like, what does that, what's going on? And there was multiple FUs involved. And I was like, what? Well, I really want to hear what, how you feel and what you're thinking. Like you really care. Like you really care. You've been yeah. focusing on caregiving and taking care of everybody else in the world. Clients, um, employees. Um, I mean, the good, good girl codependent that I um have been my entire life. I think my first time to go to Codependence Anonymous, I was, um, I think 17. And then I have gone through so many workshops trying to fix myself and 11 years of analysis, four days a week to fix myself. And it was probably about 30 years ago, I had this aha moment there's nothing wrong with me and um and and i i realized that there's no way most human beings rational logical human beings in life are going to do the journey i did like they're just not going to do it they're not going to spend four days a week <laughs> I, I actually had my business pay for and i got written off and i, I mean it's just all fell together <laughs> But I don't expect other people to be able to do what I did. So I'm like, okay, there's got to be a quicker way, a um, a more fun way, and uh, a more efficient and effective way to get through this journey. So that's when everything I did, I put into a package. And for the last 25 years, I've been building and, uh, you know, I, 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 threw spaghetti up against the wall over here and it fell down. That was in 2001 when I started my, um, I, I got my licensure in 2001, doctoral in clinical psychology. But I started doing these um, learning circles where I wanted to, let me come back a second. Actually, I wanted to start, my dissertation was zero to three. So my goal <laughs> was to to transform patterns of intergenerational transformation transmission transmission by dealing with the infant so yeah. getting the child get getting to the parent before the child is born but guess what no one wants help then they're in la la land of love they're like they don't want to look at their stuff they're just snuggling up with their baby and all is good until you get to the toddlerhood and so then then you get a, a small percentage that actually can't just pick up the kid and stick him in the car and just keep moving there's a few of the kids that i call the next world leader kids that just because you say so and all the other children are standing in line. All the other children are being little good girls and good boys. And yours is the one that is just jumping off the walls. And you're like this brilliant being that manages everything under the sun, but you can't control a toddler. Or maybe you got through the toddlerhood and you yours had its meltdown in the in the in the um seven, eight, nine, ten year old room. But the vast majority. We almost catch every parent in the teen years. And that's when the parent leaves the building. Leaves the building because the parent becomes the three-year-old in a puddle of mush. The super seven-year-old trying to control things, especially you parents that have um, wanted to do things different than your parents. And so you gave your, your child a choice and you gave your child a voice and you let them have a say in life. And then all of a sudden you want to put the ketchup back in the bottle. It's like, yeah. I have it's created a your monster. Face. <laughs> yes. It's just there. And you're like, why did I create this? <laughs> yeah. And then there's so much blaming and shaming that goes on us 
that we have failed as ourselves and worse, we feel like we failed the most important thing that we've ever created in our life. And um, so when, well, let me stop a minute. What are you hearing in all that? Yeah. So, so what you're essentially saying, and I love how you describe this. So I want to, I want to guide you into what you're saying is when we have these emotional volcanoes um, that we're raising or that are internal. Or both. Both. Yeah. <laughs> both. <laughs> both. <Okay. laughs> so we've got the the trigger that started the volcano bubbling inside. Um yes. someone said a comment, uh, whether it's Tina, you, you, I'm sure all of us can picture that moment when all of a sudden blood pressure is rising, our heart is racing, we are in that limbic response, fight, flight on make me so mad yeah we are just like oh my gosh i'm gonna lose my shit i'm losing it (laughs) yeah so those emotions now i want to talk about how that what that is inside of us Mm -hmm. and what we can see the other person who started it let's talk about our inner families because mm-hmm. you call it inner family, these emotions, and you yeah. have age groups that you've assigned, which is to me brilliant because it gives us the perspectives that we need in the in the irrational emotional moment yeah. to be able to pinpoint and say, "Oh, I'm talking to blank. I'm talking to blank." So explain yes. the inner family to me. Okay, I call it the inner family zoo, by the way. And uh, because sometimes it's like who's who in the inner family zoo and who's who's on first, what's on second and and how in the world do I get out of these big raw emotions? And it feels like the adult human being, the rational, brilliant being that you are, has left the building. The parent has left the building. So these these characters that I call their emotional states their emotional stages and zero to three, I call this little B because I'm Beth. I call it little B, but it's also little B as in the B in being three. So the beingness of being three and the little three-year-old is uh, the wow part of ourselves, like irrational, illogical, uh, I want 49 cookies. I hate you. You won't give me 49,000 cookies. It's like, there's no logic at this moment. And with this little three-year-old, inner three-year-old part of us, this is the part that can either act out in emotional humiliation or act out in total creation. Yeah. So there's a there's a positive version of this part of ourselves And there's a humiliating, embarrassing version of this part of ourselves. So a second character that I call Super B, the super seven-year-old comes along to become the parent, the second grader, becomes the parent of this emotional, out of control, irrational, puddle of mush, three-year-old. And so this little seven-year-old is kind of like when I did... um, child psychology, a a child would come in and they'd start lining up all the trucks or they'd start organizing all of the, the puzzle pieces. Or so this is the logical, the rational, the organizer, the goal setter, the good girl, good boy. Yeah. yeah, I'm all that. I'm all that. (laughs) And so, so this, um, that's a little bit more the inner teen, but (laughs) <laughs> the, but the super, the super seven year old wouldn't let that part show because she just be she would just be all buttoned up and and doing it right. So it's yes. telling so it's telling the the three year old, you know, get it together. You're gonna be you are gonna be kicked out of the village. You know, put a smile on, fake it till you make it. Get that get that face in order. Um, let's go pay your bills. You're going to die if you don't. So it's, it's kind of this should monster and this, uh, critic 
and this brilliant thinker. So it's really tied to the brain and thinking things through. And then there's a fourth, a, a third character that comes along that is like telling this character, by the way, that, that character has just overwhelming structure and overwhelming skills and it works and it works and it works until it doesn't. And then you hit, um, you've gone overboard, you are no longer having fun. It ne it feels like you can't win with the world. You can't win with your kids. You can't win with yourself. You can't win with the 15 pounds you're trying to lose. You can't win with the money that's in the bank. You're spending more than you're making. And it just starts to feel like you're sinking in the middle of the ocean. And then my favorite comes along, the inner teen. Bum, 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 bum. And the inner teen comes in is like, take a chill pill. You're not that significant. You're not even that important to the rest of the world. You're a speck. So that's one part of the inner teen. And the other part of the inner teen is I'm all that in a bag of chips. I got this. We don't need to follow any stinking rules. We'll do whatever we want, when we want, how we want. We don't need people telling us what to do. And it really feels like the teenager that you see that has gone from this good child this collaborative child, this follow the rules child that just all of the sudden stops talking to you or starts talking to you in a way that you don't even recognize them. And, you know, there's been thousands and thousands of books written about this, who invaded my, who invaded my child and, and all of these aspects. So the, the inner team comes along. So before I talk about the fourth character, did I miss anything? Hmm. No, I, I think you summed it up and I, and I just want to share like the, the cool thing about that too, is if you don't have kids, you can definitely relate to this because you either have seen, you have nephews, nieces, friends, kids, you know, these ages, whether you have raised them or not. That's yeah. what I love about these character, emotional characters within us is that they're so relatable because whether we experience it ourselves, we know people or we have them around us. Or we we've been, see. or so, we've been, or we've been, or we, yeah, like we've we gone have, through, we are them. We've gone through all these stages in chronological real time. And we get to daily, hourly, minute by minute, go through these stages as we age. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and one of the things that I love to, um, you named your kids and one of the exercises that you had me do was get to know my kids in my inner family and create those connections with them. And when you can relate, so my three-year-old is called Podunk <laughs> and Aww. my, and that's a family little nickname but it brings me back to my childhood. And then my seven-year-old is Major Brown. <laughs> my last <laughs> name is Brown. And, you know. <laughs> yes. And my teenager is Mars. Hey. Yes. Hey, Mars here. <laughs> I'm the fun, you know, that the teenager is the fun part of me. And yes. um, so I think that's a cool connection, too, to be able for us as individuals to name ours, ours or connect with ours so that we have more um understanding i guess or or we build on that beautiful. person within beautiful beautiful so. and <clears throat> there's a fourth character <clears throat> and that character is db for me dr beth db or the divine being the divine wise self and i always um tease if you can't find yours borrow mine for a minute and a half because it'll be very in soon order. You will have one that knows you better, sees you better, um, is, is the, the best mother, the best lover, the best cheerleader, the best mentor, the best, everything that your soul needs is from within. And when you get to the inner teen, your closest, connection to that faith, your closest connection to that spiritual being. And so however you want to see that divine wise self, it's really cute. When I talk to kids, I'll come to you one second. When I talk to kids, I'll say, how old is your divine wise self? And it's almost, 
like kids under under 10 almost always say um 22 21 <laughs> that's their that's their divine wise self and i'll say okay really and they'll say no wait 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 27 28 so it's like that's as far as their divine self that's as far as they can see their wisdom that's as far as they can see their divine wise self what's been interesting um i'm 62 and I just realized I've had to upgrade my divine being because I now look like and act like and feel like and experience life the way when I was 30 and 40 and 20, I imagined I would be. Mm -hmm. So now mm -hmm. it's how do I find my divine wise self 90, 100? Um, and, and what is that? What is that being look like for me, feel like for me? How do I take it to that next level of wisdom? So find your own inner guidance. And this inner guidance is all omnipotent, all loving. This is the, the guidance that, um, uh, you know, no matter what I say, I hate life. Oh, what is it, baby girl? You know, I hate the world. Oh, what is it, baby girl? Um, I've ruined everything. Oh, sweetheart. I'm loving you so much in these big feelings. Um, and so it's, it's a, it's like an ideal loving being that maybe you are one one percent on the planet that had this type of mom. Um, my experience has been that most of us have been raised by uh, children raising children, raising children, raising children. Emotional development, and um, when we trigger our parents, some of us became parentified adults, super seven year olds at three where we became the parent of the parent. Mm -hmm. And um, one of these days, I'm going to write a book called The Hell of Being Raised by the Perfect Parent because they were perfect to the world and they attempted to be perfect. And when you're raised by someone that's perfect, what that means is you're supposed to also be perfect. Mm -hmm. And as a human, young, emotional state, it's messy, there is no such thing. There's no such thing as perfection. One of my songs. And so the divine, the divine wise self comes in. And if you can't see your inner family, it's because you're being one of those characters. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're in a puddle of mush and you're like, I can't find my wise self. It's because you're in your little three-year-old. Then borrow somebody else's, borrow Marcy's. She has one of the most divine, loving, kind coaching strategies. She's my go-to when I am, you know, just Dr. Beth has left the building. I'm like Marcy on speed dial. Marcy, help. I can't find myself. I'm stuck in a story. I don't even know which kids wear. And, uh, you know, and it usually happens when I'm in an intimate relationship that gets all clouded. And I can't yeah. find my way out of a wet paper bag. Which is the village that we want to create. I mean, right. it is so helpful to have people that we can connect with that know this language, know how to help each other through that. Because when you're in the weeds, you can't see anywhere but the weeds. And you right. need someone to rise up and um, and help. And, and love, you in, and love you in the weeds love you in it and know that this is just a, they love you and they know that you're not stuck in there. It, it is right. Don't no, be attached. There's no judgment. There's no, it just is what it is. These are emotions that flow through us. And in five seconds, you could have it all together and know exactly where you're at and you're like oh wow huh okay and move got, on got it and again right no back in the zone but yeah and that's the hard part is when we are out in our element when we're with people there are only a few select people that can handle us in our vulnerable state or a few people that we allow to see that because we don't because there isn't a frame of mind to make sense of that being fluid. It's either, oh, she's just very emotional and she's a wreck. So don't go to her because she's going to be emotional next time. You get these labels put on you of how you're being in that moment. But that moment passes. 
those labels, let me tweak one word there. Those labels we put on ourselves. We all, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. And and, I, I, and it I goes judge back, myself. It, it goes mm-hmm. back to that, these two sides of the coin where this, there's a side of an expectation. We should know better. We should be better. We should do better. We should be beyond this. We should act our age and all the other you know, crazy things that we're told. Yet the reality is I'm in a funkity funk, funk, funk. And so trying to stay in this dissonance in an either or world is, is maddening. It's traumatizing. It's wounding. It's impossible. So one of the things that I do is I help find the yes. And yes, you feel like you're swimming through a vomit pool and yes, you are brilliant and divine. And sometimes putting those two juxtapositions next to each other makes our little super seven-year-old head explode. Where do you see that in your life, Marcy? Yeah. I mean, I see that in my relationships all over. Um, In my relationship with my child where (laughs) I'm the mom, but then if I break down and... Oh, so I had a, I had a teenager moment I can share because we've gotten past this, but she, um, spent the night at a boy's house and that was not okay with me. And it was not during my, so we're, we're divorced her dad and I, and, um, so it was during her dad's time and not mine. And, but I have location services and, and we agreed to keep those on no matter what. And I found out about it and I flipped out. Not only did I flip out on her, I got a hold of the boy's parents and flipped out on her. <laughs> and another friend who told me, like, I, I just made a mess of it and I didn't have all the facts. <laughs> I didn't. And, and yeah. I just went off. And when I finally calmed down and we got to the crux of the issue, yes, she did spend the night there. And yet, and, and the mom didn't know. And I, you know, when we got all through it, I basically had to come to my daughter and say, I had a mama bear moment and, and I reacted and I wasn't logical. I wasn't professional like I I I had an emotional uproar Mm -hmm. and and but here's you know here's what I did to clean it up here's how here's why here here are my emotions and it was so vulnerable because I had to be vulnerable to her but Mm -hmm. also the women (laughs) that I didn't even know yeah and you know, I live in a small enough town that we could pass each other a lot <laughs> or know right. people who know people. So I had to, I had to eat crow. I had to deal with myself and, but, but come at it humbly and just say, Hey ladies, I had a mama bear moment and they all understood. Like we get it. Yes. And, thank you know, goodness. and you, and you asked for a do-over, you re yeah. you rehealed the relationship with each and every one of them. Who were you being in that moment? Your inner three-year-old, your super seven-year-old, or your inner teen? I think it was a combination of all of them. Yeah. Because my three-year-old was throwing the tantrum of, you know, why, 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 why did this happen? She knows better and all and the, and the, how did this not let that happen? I failed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I failed my kid. Mm -hmm. What, you know, I thought I raised her right. Yes. (laughs) And uh, then my seven-year-old was like, well, I'm going to tell them who's up and this mom, why didn't she know? And why, why isn't she, why is she letting someone at, you know, a girl stay at her house and I need her to know that I'm not a mom that thinks that that's okay. Yes. <laughs> you know, I have yes. rules and you, I don't you, want you went all you went literally onto each person's porch. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> we talk about being on somebody's emotional porch. Marcy took it to the next level to be on their literal porch. <laughs> and I literally, I mean, I could have like but yes. And then I think as the teenager when I kindly when I had to really realize okay, I overreacted. I used my teenager way to relate with them, to just be like, 
Hey, I don't know what happened. Logic went out the window and mama bear was in the house and it just exploded. I love it. I yeah. love it. That makes, that makes perfect sense. So how did you heal it with your daughter? And did she, when you were um, losing it on her, was she in her inner three-year-old and her super seven-year-old or in her inner teen? And what did the parents were they in their inner three-year-old, inner seven-year-old, or inner teen? Wow. See how the dynamic gets so complex. Yes. <laughs> these emotions. So and, and um, one and one more. You don't have to answer all these questions, but and one more. What did your mom say about it? Your biological mom and sister. Were they in their inner three-year-old, inner seven-year-old, and inner teen? Yeah, I had to so, wait until the whole situation was done before I could explain even go to there, them. Because even go there. <laughs> I knew how they would uh, respond, but I did tell them. Yeah, so Maddie, um, at first she was just very shocked. And I think it. she started crying. So she goes three-year-old immediately because she and I are so close and she doesn't want to disappoint me. She and thought she was she'd so let confused. you down. Yeah, she was just very confused. So emotions take over her, first of all. And then she was like, um, then she started getting mad at me um, for, and so it's probably the seven-year-old mad at me for calling the parents. And I, I would <laughs> say that's more the teenager. What, you think so? what happens quite frequently is as one person is seven, taking somebody's inventory, telling them what to do, when to do it, how to do it, where to do it over on their porch, on, on their mm -hmm. proverbial emotional porch. Typically the person either goes young and completely turns into a puddle of mush, goes teen and in complete rebellion. <laughs> Very rarely does somebody go, good point. You made an <laughs> excellent point. Thank you for sharing. I was not in my right mind and I, you know, I needed to get myself together and be a good girl and go ahead, punish me now. Take my arms, take me away. No, that was not her. Yeah, you're right. She was like, what? Why did you do that? And then when I apologized to her and I told her what I did, she was like, yeah, mom, you should not have done that. That was not right. You should have come to me. You should have figured out the facts. You mean you told me stuff that was not facts? You didn't figure it so out now, before you. <laughs> so now she's in her super seven-year-old <laughs> taking your inventory over mm -hmm. on your porch, telling you what to do, when to do it, how to do it, where to do it. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. Flip. so she she flipped it on you. Which is mm -hmm. which is very common. Once yeah. we go to once we go to the, to our inner teen and get vulnerable and raw and you know I blew it, babe, I blew it. Then a lot of times the kids flip to their teen, flip to their super seven year old. And sometimes we want them to flip to their super seven year old because then they become the rational, logical thinker for themselves. Yeah. 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 So one like, of the ways I teach parenting me. <laughs> yes. Yes. I so many times I hear parents saying, My kids are telling me what I should wear and how I should look and who I should go out with and what time I should be home. I'm like, who's the freaking adult here? And the problem is they are experiencing you as needing a parent. Mm -hmm. So the the one of the ways to get to to and through this emotional stages of development into the divine wise self. One, teach your kids everything you know. Be vulnerable and raw and, and tell on yourself. Ask for a do-over. Be totally willing to be wrong. Like I am I am willing to be wrong about everything all the time. I actually had an interesting, doing a meditation today and uh, the the coach was talking about how we all have such a need for certainty and I said, I was thinking in my mind, well, I'm I'm way past that. Like I'm all into, there's no certainty. I'm surrendering to no certainty. And then she said, and then what we do is we come up with our own rules. And it's like, oh, I've got uncertainty rules to give me my certainty. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, th this is a, this is a, a quagmire of growth 
for all of us. So if we see someone else's negative, we're being negative, seeing their negativity. If we see somebody as a hypocrite, what is the biggest hypocrite of all hypocrites calling somebody a hypocrite? We're, we're calling them out as a hypocrite. That's hypocritical. If we're truly believing that we're, we're coming from a space of love and, and accountability and ownership. So we probably have given people about as much as they could yeah. swallow in, like uh, <laughs> in one moment, but th this can apply as, as Marcy said, this can apply in multiple ways. We'd love to have your questions. Yeah, but you're, um, we think you're full of it or, uh, whatever, whatever you want to say, bring it, bring it. As they say, I did this one workshop <clears throat> with a whole bunch of parents and kids. And as I was leading the workshop, I said, I, I double dog dare anybody to tell me where I'm screwed up. Cause I'm always learning. And one of the teenagers put her hand in the air and had a brilliant point. I said, you're so brilliant. Come up here. You're going to co-facilitate this with me. And, and I said, if I say anything that is off color or I'm not owning my own stuff or feels out of integrity, you just jump in there. And if we can be this way with our kids where we value their dissonance, we value their difference, we embrace their defiance with love. That's the, that's the game I'm playing. What's the game you're playing, Marcy? Yeah, I'm playing that game and <laughs> yes, uh, I'm, you know, authenticity and, and that's, that's a, that's a word that gets thrown around. So my definition of that is being real, um, in my heart, being mm -hmm. able to speak that to everyone who's in my life. Um, so having language around the authenticity in a way that invites conversation and caring. So getting my ego out of the way, letting me be curious, um, in relationship. And I think that's where I'm at right now because I'm, I'm ready to, I've been the nice girl. I've been the, the yes yes person and i could go the total extreme or i could stay in like let's just be curious let's ask questions let's seek to understand let's be authentic and share share in a in a collaborative conversation where our true selves can be seen and heard i love it i love it <clears throat> and i'm going to uh build put one building block on top of that I actually teach people how to be authentically manipulative. Mm. So if you're interested on how to do mm. exactly <laughs> what Marcy just said and still have ways to get things done and get collaborated and find the yes and and find the win, win, win. I teach the kids how to authentically manipulate with love their parents. And I teach the parents how to authentically manipulate with love their kids, their employees, um, even their dogs. <laughs> so, <laughs> so to be continued and yes. I like to use these words that are like, ah, what? She just said manipulate. That is such a wrong word, but come listen and find out how we can actually find the yes. And in relationship, it's pretty yeah, fun. Let's do it. Join how us. Can we stand it, Marcy. Woo! So good. Right. So good. <laughs> one more one word out. You got a one word out? Uh loving it up. I'll take it. I'll take it. Mm. Two words. Thanks, you Marcy. Change, Breaking change the rules. The <laughs> I like it. I like it. Till the next time. Bye.